Well, it's great to be with you. It's, uh, it's a joy to be back in Galatians. So if you've got your Bible, turn with me to Galatians chapter 5. Uh, but before we go there and start to work this morning, I just wanted to mention something from last week. If you were here, you got to hear a little bit of... Uh, Finney from uh, India, who was sharing a little bit of the ministry of JKPS. I hope you put the pieces together that he is the, the man who oversees the ministry that David Kiskus is a part of, who we support as a church. Uh, we support him in prayer and through our finances, allowing him to plant churches in uh, the area of India where he lives. And it was interesting. Our missions team got to have lunch after with Finney. And uh, I wish you could all been there, to be honest, because hearing a little bit more of what's going on and the kind of setting that they're ministering in. It was absolutely humbling. So, so me with my, I don't know what it was. Maybe it probably felt obnoxious. I didn't mean it that way. I just wanted to know, what does life look like for this fellow David who I've been praying for for a year? Uh, and Finney said, well, he lives in a village. I'm like, so right away, I've got pictures. I know what a village looks like. I've seen the postcards, right? He says, well, there'd be about twenty or 30,000 people. I go, well... Okay, hold on. That's not the picture of a village in my mind. And he said, and they farm. So I said, well, how much would a farm cost? He said, well, I said, well how big do you mean? I said, I don't know. I mean, I don't know what number you'd pull out. I, I just pulled up 100 acres. Thinking, 100 acres, that would be about enough to support someone. I said, 100 acres. And he laughs. He's like, no one can afford 100 acres. He said, if you have two acres, you are very wealthy. Like two acres. How do you support a family on, on a glorified yard? He said, really, most people are farming and they, they would be doing well to have 4,000 square feet. And it just kind of hit me. It's like there's some among us. We've got 4,000 square feet of living space. And he said, that, that's what they're up to and that's how they make their living and support their family in 4,000 square feet. That we are blessed. Not just to sit back and enjoy. I think God has blessed us so that we can support those who are taking the gospel into those kind of hard places. Um, so be praying for them. It's a privilege to be a part. And, uh, and we need to keep praying for David and for the church planting efforts going on there. By the way, it's great to have Tim and Katrina here. I know... You weren't here to be put under the spotlight, but make sure you say hi to them. They are uh, part of our camp, directing our Sunny Break camp, and it's just a joy to have you guys. We love the camp and what you guys are doing. We're in Galatians chapter 5, and uh, we've been here since September. I joked with the early service. I said, probably never before in your life have you heard so much talk about circumcision. Um, it's a very strange little book, and I say that because we're right back into the heart of the argument today, and Paul's not finished. He keeps looping through these subjects. Last time we were together two weeks ago looking at Galatians, he was, he was dealing with this very odd discussion, really wrestling through the question of who are the offspring of Abraham, and I'm guessing probably that's not been particularly a question that you've had to struggle with. You've probably wrestled with, you know, what's God's will for my life? And who am I supposed to marry? And what am I supposed to do? Where am I supposed to live? But probably not many of us have sat there going, I just, I need to know if I am an offspring of Abraham. And Paul actually takes it up a notch. He says it's not just about whether you are a son or daughter of Abraham. He said actually the real question of, of Galatians chapter 4 is, if Abraham is your father, who is your mother? Because there's two possibilities, Paul says. There, there's Hagar who has a child who's a slave. And there's Sarah who's the, the wife who has a child who is a son. And as Paul walks through this really odd story that for some of you may be sort of going over your head going, I don't even know who Hagar and Sarah is. I hope what you'll understand is that Paul's using a story familiar to the people he's speaking to to, to unpack a question, the question that goes something like this, how are we made right with God? It's that simple. Just, how are men and women, just like us, made right with God? Knowing that sin separates us from Him, so we have this problem. We're not in relationship, so how is that restored? And Paul walks all the way through Galatians through all these strange stories and analogies to really get us to the point where we would see that in his view, 
And his understanding of who God is, we are made right simply through faith in what Jesus has done for us, giving himself on a cross and rising again to new life. That's it. But he said, here's the problem. So many of us go through life and are told and taught and come to believe it's Jesus plus other things that surely there must be something we need to do. And that's where all the discussion of circumcision and keeping the law comes in because that's what's going on for this group of people in Galatia. They're confused. Is it Jesus or is it Jesus plus something that we should do to make ourselves right with God? And Paul comes back and says it's just Jesus. And we arrived in chapter 5 verse 1 with this incredible concluding statement. It's almost like a doxology. Paul just bursts out, and here's what he says. For freedom Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. That's it. It's, it's just Jesus. Now, when I read that statement, here's the picture that comes right to my mind. I'm not sure if it's totally the correct one, but it helps me think through what's going on next because I've read lots of World War II stories and seen videos and, and you know, those kind of things. And I have this, this image that comes to mind, and maybe you've seen the pictures, of the camps after the war as the, the soldiers come through and liberate them. And then, I don't know if you've seen the pictures of people just standing there. And they don't know what to do. They're free. The gates are open. And they're just kind of in shock. And it would be an odd thing for those people to go up to the, the liberators, the soldiers who have freed them, and ask, well, why did you free us? Because wouldn't the answer be, well, we, we freed you so that you are free. The point wasn't for us to tell you what to do. The point was that you would be free people. And I find myself, and maybe you've kind of wrestled up against this, when we come to know Jesus and follow Jesus, we quickly, we, we jump over the, the whole idea of freedom and we say, but Jesus, what are we supposed to do? And Paul just comes and says, here's what Scripture tells us. You were set free so that you could be a free people. You hear what he's saying? For, for freedom, Christ has set us free. The purpose was that you would be free. Now, you got to almost push pause right at verse 1. And if you leap down to verse 13, you're going to see that Paul's going to pick this up and say, okay, I understand the struggle because the struggle is, what do we do next? What do we do with our freedom? And Paul's going to wrestle that out a little bit beginning in verse 13. But between verse 1 and 13, Paul takes one more big loop back through this whole issue of the law and our work and circumcision, all these kind of things. It's, it's about the third or fourth time he's gone through this whole thing. He wants to wrestle it out one more time before he starts applying this incredible truth that the gospel sets us free. So, so really, I want to I get through those verses and then wrap up in verse 13, 14, 15. That's our goal this morning. So buckle in. We've got a lot of ground to cover because Paul jumps in in the very next verse and says, look, I, Paul, say to you that if you accept circumcision, Christ will be of no advantage to you. Well, why does he say that? Well, he's been saying it all along. If you add to Jesus, you lose Jesus. You, you can't add things to him and still have Jesus plus the other stuff. He goes on and he says, I testify again that every man who accepts circumcision, that he is obligated to keep the whole law. He says it's like an all or nothing thing. If you're going to take a little bit of it, you have to somehow do all of it. And he says none of us are able to do all of it. The law can't save us. And here's his conclusion. He said you're severed from Christ. You had to be justified by the law. You have fallen away from grace. Now this sounds like a, a pretty serious spot he's arrived at. It sounds like, to me anyway, at this point, he's saying to the Galatians, look, you have stepped over a line. You are now no longer a part of the people of God. And somehow, because of what you believed and what you're doing, you are severed from Jesus Christ, and grace is no longer yours. But look at what he says in verse 5. For through the Spirit, by faith, we ourselves eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness. He includes them right back in this. It's a great thing. Paul does it multiple times as he writes his letters to these churches through the New Testament. He, he sort of comes right up to the point of an extremely strongly worded warning. He does it in 1 Corinthians 6. It's a textbook there. He warns them about what they're doing and comes to the point of saying, this is what it means to be outside of the kingdom. And then he steps back and he goes, but, but you're not. You're the people of God. 
We together are the people of God who, who hope in righteousness. Paul's just wanting them to see how serious and dangerous it is to start playing with legalism and start playing with rules as though somehow that's going to earn the favor of God. Paul says it never will. It can't. It will lead you away from God, not to Him. Now, we probably don't get too close to what Paul's talking about to the Galatians. I would guess. We don't come up against the, the law in the same sort of ways, but, but we have our own unique twists and versions of this, our own dangers that we do come close to as we try to live and pursue Christ. And here's probably the chief one I wrestle with and I've heard others wrestle with. It's something called the debtor's ethic. Whether you've ever heard the term probably is irrelevant. You've probably had the thought, and the thought goes something like this. Jesus Christ has done so much for me, and he has. Now, I will tell you, Christ has done everything for me. Without him, I have no hope. But the debtor's ethic goes one step further, and it says something like this. Therefore, I need to do all I can with all of my life to repay him for what he's done. Now, on the surface, it, there's something about it that sounds almost right. After all, we should have gratitude. There should be thanksgiving. Our lives should be changed, and it should come out of joy and out of love for Jesus Christ. But that one slight twist that says somehow I'm going to repay him is a deadly little twist. Let me tell you where it leads. It leads to two things. Firstly, it leads to the fact that we might actually lose the magnitude of what Jesus has done on the cross. And the second thing is it ends up with us losing the fact that Jesus continues to serve us. Let me tell you how I get there. Firstly, the, the one of losing the magnitude of the cross. Here's why that happens. If, if for example, let's just say you have someone in your family that saves me from great peril. There's a car crash, someone from your family rushes in, saves my life, but in the process, loses theirs. The analogy to Jesus and what he's done for us. Imagine now that I came to you the next week and said, you know what? I'm so thankful. And I want to give you this card. And in the card I said, I'm thankful, I'm full of gratitude, and to show my gratitude, I wanted just to do something, and so please accept this $10 that I'm giving you. How would you feel? My guess is you would go, this is actually insulting. That you would put a value on the sacrifice made for you at $10? It doesn't honor the sacrifice. It actually dishonors. It diminishes it by us saying, let me do something in response and let it be this big. Now, let me ask you the question, how big should it be before it starts to honor that? Is $100. If I put $100 in the car, $1,000, $10,000, I mean $100,000, how much does it take before you open it and go, well, okay, that... That somehow is worth the sacrifice. I, I think the answer is going to be there is no amount of money. If it's someone you love who's given their life, there is no amount of money you could put in the card where you would open it and go, okay, that, that kind of repays it. But you see, we do the same sort of thing when we come back to Jesus and say, I know you've done incredible things for me on the cross, so let me do something in repayment. I don't think you can ever do, you don't have enough years left or strength in your body. You don't have enough wisdom. You don't have enough resources to even begin to scratch the surface of how great the sacrifice of Jesus was for you. Now, it doesn't mean we don't live for his glory. It just means we don't do it in a way trying to repay him. The second problem, of course, is that it's not just a one-time thing, right? Jesus didn't just die on the cross. That's the event. Go and pay off that one moment. Scripture tells us Jesus continues to serve. He continues to minister. He's at the Father's right hand on our behalf every day of our life. So he does this monumental thing on the cross for us. And then every day the debt just keeps growing. We're not repaying anything. It's getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And I think any of our attempts to try to repay him just diminish the sacrifice he's made for us. So there's only two options. One is we have to diminish what he does on the cross. Or two is we have to discard his service for us day to day. 
in order for us to somehow think we can repay what he's done. It never works. It's not possible. And so Paul just comes back to this point over and over again. He says, that is not the point. The point is Jesus freed us. It's a gift. That's what the gospel is all about. Now, verse 5. He says this, For through the Spirit, by faith, we ourselves eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness. If you're into underlining things in your Bible, there's going to be a couple this morning, but that would be one where I would say, underline that last little statement. The hope of righteousness. For Paul, this is going to become the big idea of these next few verses. This is going to become the thought that he's going to just hang everything on. Now let me make sure that we're on the same page because it's an important little phrase. First, first the hope part. Alright, so if you were to go out into your neighborhood and talk to your neighbors and say, what does hope mean? Probably they're going to say something like, well, hope is... It's like wishful thinking. You hope for something that isn't likely to come to pass. I used the example in the early service. It was quite ironic because I used the example because I'm a football guy of you know, hoping if you're a Cleveland Browns fan that they're going to win the Super Bowl. The reason I used it is they're 0-6. Mathematically, it could happen. But if you know football and you know Cleveland, it's like, <laughs> yeah. That is wishful thinking. It's never going to happen. Apparently, in between services, they were leading in their game. So... Um, I suppose it could. But you understand the idea, right, of what hope means for most people. Hope just means that's not going to happen, but I sure wish it would. And if we come to Paul's phrase and think that's what he means, we read something like this. We have this hope of righteousness. It would be nice if it happened, but we know it's never going to happen. Is that what Paul means? Like, man, I sure wish one day there could be righteousness, but... It's never going to happen. Now, there's days because of the sin we wrestle with, you might feel like that. But that is not what Paul's saying. Paul actually uses the word hope in pretty much the exact opposite way. He would mean it like this. Boy, I sure hope this winter we get snow on Silver Star. Right? I'm not a huge fan of winter. But you and I both know there will be snow on Silver Star this winter. Probably already has been. And there will be much more of it. It's, it's pretty much a certainty. That's how Paul uses hope. When he talks about waiting for righteousness and the hope that he has, he's saying, I am absolutely certain this is going to happen. In fact, other places, he's so certain, he writes about it as though it's already happened, even though it hasn't. And sometimes if you read Paul, you're going, well, this is confusing. It's like he's already describing something that hasn't happened, but he writes as though it has. It's because he's so sure. He knows it will happen. What is it that he knows is going to happen? Well, it's this last little thought here. He has this hope of righteousness. Oh, there we go. Do you all see the bug climbing on me and I didn't? Anyway, yeah, front rows did. You could let me know next time, Tanya. There's a bug crawling up here. Um, Where were we? Hope of righteousness. There's where we were. So he uses this, this little phrase, this, this hope of righteousness. Now what is he talking about? The phrase actually could go one of two ways. Right? On the one hand, to say the hope of righteousness, he could mean something like this, that, that he knows he is not currently righteous, but that he knows one day he will be. That's biblically true and accurate. Right? We wake up every morning, we look at ourselves in the mirror, we know that we are not There, we have not arrived. However you want to say it, we're not holy, we're not fully righteous. We know in Christ we are because we have His righteousness, but but in terms of our day-to-day wrestling with sin, we know we are far from where we would want to be. And Paul says, on the one hand, I have the hope that one day I will be fully righteous. Read elsewhere where he wrestles this thing out. He says, it's because I know I'm going to see Jesus, and when I see Him, I will be totally transformed. He says, and it's absolutely certain. If you're wrestling with sin today, I'm going to say, don't give up. This should not be the the instruction that says, well, it's going to happen one day, so I just won't even bother. This should be the instruction that says, keep fighting, because you know in the end you'll win. It is certain. Now, on the other side, the phrase means something like this. The hope of righteousness could also mean that I have hope because I see little glimmers of righteousness in my life. Not fully realized, I'm not fully perfect, I'm not without sin, obviously. But if I look back in my own life over 10 or 20 years, I go, 
but there's actually been progress, not as much as I would like, but there's been, there's been steps. Things that were temptations that aren't as strong of temptation. Issues that I've moved on from. And Paul says that is also the hope of righteousness, meaning that we have these little installments. We see God's work in our lives and it gives us the certainty that one day he's going to finish it. And Paul says, we have this hope. This is what it means to be followers of Jesus Christ. We can wait because we have this certain hope that God is at work in us. So he's saying to the Galatians, whatever else you do, do not give up. You've got this hope. It is certain. And I moves on. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision counts for anything, but only faith working through love. Now, if you've followed along Paul's argument, and think about this statement for a few minutes, you're probably going to go, hold on a second. This makes no sense. Up to now, isn't what Paul is arguing all along is that it's Jesus plus not getting circumcised. It almost starts to feel like Paul has created a a new law. Here's what you need to be right with God. You need to have Jesus plus not follow the law. In fact, if you stopped reading right at verse 5 of chapter 5, I would say that would probably be your conclusion. That's what it means to be a follower of Jesus. And then Paul comes along and says, shockingly in verse 6, actually, neither circumcision or uncircumcision counts for anything. In other words, he says, it's not about whether you follow the law or don't follow the law. It's all about Jesus Christ. Don't turn not following the law into the new law. That's what he's, that's what he's wrestling out. And you, you see this in his own life. If you go to Acts chapter 16 and read this story, you'll see one day Paul decides he's going to take Timothy along with him on a short-term missions trip. Essentially, that would be our lingo. He says, Timothy, uh, only one problem it's not about getting a visa and getting you know, your immunizations. We're going to, to Jewish people. They won't listen to you unless you're circumcised. It's an interesting process. So Paul says, so we're going to get you circumcised. Now, if you read Galatians, you go, hold on a second. This is the guy who's been four chapters now saying, don't do it, don't do it, don't do it, and now he goes and says, Timothy, do it? How, how does that make any sense of Paul's understanding of the gospel? But if you understand this verse, you'll understand why he did it. He looks and says, it doesn't matter. If it's pragmatic for him to get circumcised so he can proclaim the gospel, the fact that he does it or doesn't do it adds nothing before God. It doesn't advantage him or disadvantage. The only advantage is Jesus. That's why Paul is able to say, I just become all things to all people. Because the whole thing is about proclaiming the gospel, not about making a law out of keeping the law or a law out of not keeping the law. If you want to celebrate a festival... Go ahead and celebrate the festival. As long as you don't turn it into a salvation thing. If you go and read where he talks to the Romans in chapter 14 of, of Romans or the Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, you'll see him have this same discussion. He comes to the Romans and he says, look, some of you are convinced you shouldn't eat meat. Others are convinced you should eat meat. Now, is he talking about being vegetarian or not? No. He's talking about some religious ideas. So, In Paul's day, all the meat is being sacrificed at temples to false gods, to idols. You can understand why for the early Christians, this is a pretty, this is confusing. You know, we used to go to the temple and worship false gods, but but now if we go there to get meat and buy meat or have meat slaughtered, is there something about that that is dishonoring to Jesus Christ? And they're wrestling, and some of them have concluded, well, it's a false god. It's the temple to the god. If we buy meat, it's going to be you know, furthering that whole thing. So we just will not eat meat. And other people go, yeah, but for us, it's not really an issue of conscience. And Paul comes along, and how does he settle it? He says, just be firmly convinced of what you think is right. Do whatever you're going to do to honor Jesus Christ. Because it's not about a rule that says don't eat meat or you do eat meat. It's about how do we honor Jesus and communicate the gospel. And then he says to them, oh, here's the one thing you need to know. You've got to love one another. You might think differently. You might be in two different camps. But the one thing you must do is love each other regardless of what conclusion you've reached. So he comes to them and says, your actions, circumcision or not circumcision, doesn't count for anything. 
So Paul, tell us what does. What are we supposed to go home and do? That's, that's what I wrestled with all the way up to chapter 4. It's like, Paul, but what do I do? Tell me something that on a Sunday afternoon, if I want to take an action step and use some effort to do something of value, Paul, what is it? You get it in the last little phrase there. Only thing that counts is faith working through love. There's what counts. Faith working through love. Now this is a little phrase he's picked up on various times throughout Galatians. He uses it various times when he writes. What he means by it is that we, we grow in our faith by hearing the word of God. You see it over in chapter 3 verse 3 where he talks to the Galatians and he says, you think you, you began this life of faith by faith in Jesus but you're going to be perfected by your own efforts? He says you won't. Faith grows by hearing. Hearing what? Hearing God's word. So he tells the Romans so clearly. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. If you want the one thing that you can do today, the one action, and it's not an action that you take to somehow earn the love of God, to earn his favor, to earn forgiveness. It's the action you take because you have received salvation and you love Jesus and you want to draw near to him. Here's the only action. Go read his word. Here's the funny part of it. What's the hardest thing? Ever notice this? What is the thing that as followers of Jesus we struggle with over and over and over? It's reading his word. I mean, we tend not to admit it. We come up with quite nice sounding ways to describe our shortcomings. But many of us struggle to read God's Word. And Paul says that is the only thing we can do. So this afternoon, if you have a few minutes, and every afternoon for the rest of your life, read God's Word. It's where faith comes from. As we come to know God, read His promises, God's Spirit works within us, and faith grows. All right, verse 7. We might have to jump ahead at some point here, but we'll try these verses really quick. You're running well who hindered you from obeying the truth. This persuasion is not from him who calls you. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. In a nutshell, what he says is it's like you're in a, a foot race, although I think a NASCAR kind of image is way better for me. You're driving your car and a car cuts you off, and it wasn't that you managed to get back on the track and you just kind of swerved a bit. The picture is you actually went right off the track. Except he tells it in running sort of terms. You're running, someone cuts you off, you didn't stay on the course, you're now completely off course. That's the analogy of that you were running well, who hindered you? That's the language. He's describing a running race. You've been cut off and he's telling them if you keep going, it's not like you're on a parallel track. There's the Jesus track and the Jesus plus the other stuff track. Don't worry, they're pretty much the same. He's actually saying, no, there's the Jesus track and the one you're on. And they're not going to get you in the same place. In fact, he says it clearly in verse 8, this persuasion is not from him who calls you. This is not from God. This is coming from somewhere else. It's that clear for Paul. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. This is a little axiom. We, we have them. We use them. So we'll use an apple one. You know, one bad apple spoils a whole bunch. Right? We, know, we know what we mean by that. We know we're not talking about apples. We're talking about the influence of things that spreads. This little saying in the year... 50 something AD meant that if you took one little step in a certain direction, it was inevitable that you'd take the next little step. Right? A little leaven leavens the whole bunch. The idea is that if you take one little step in the direction of legalism, I'm going to do this thing because it makes me right before God. Paul says, it is inevitable that you will do this one and this one, and one day you'll wake up and you'll go, How did I ever get here? Paul says, The answer is. That first little step way back there. She's saying, be careful. This, that's the whole point of 5 verse 1. Stand firm. It takes effort to stay free and not get back into legalism. Now he goes in verse 10. I have confidence in the Lord that you will take no other view than mine. The one who is troubling you will bear the penalty, whoever he is. Where does Paul's confidence come from? It doesn't come from the Galatians. Isn't that the... That to me is the greatest thing. It's not that he looks at the church in Galatia and says... I'm sure that you're going to come back around. Because, wow, you guys are just, you're so smart, and you're so talented, and you're just amazing people. His confidence comes from Jesus. You understand that? That's why he's so sure. He says, I know who Jesus is. I have seen his glory. And in Paul's mind, he can't imagine 
that anyone who has ever seen and tasted the goodness of Jesus would ever walk from it. So he just says, if you've seen how good Jesus is, I know you're going to come back around. Because it's impossible to walk away from him. He's that good. Let's jump ahead to verse 13. Uh, so we don't run out of time here. For you were called to freedom, brothers. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. Paul says, here it is. Here's the scenario. Jesus Christ set you free. The gates of that prison are wide open and you're standing there and Paul says, here's the question. The question is, what do we do next? Okay, Jesus, I've been liberated. Why am I liberated? And Jesus says, well, you're liberated so that you can be free. There's your answer. But now what? Now our world will supply all sorts of answers. We have a version of what freedom looks like. Remember, there used to be these commercials. I'm showing my age. I don't think I've seen them in quite a while. The Freedom 55 ones. Even if you haven't seen them, you know what it means, right? That if you could just get enough saved up, that you could hit 55 and you would be free. Now, what does the freedom look like that, that's being sold to us? Now, you have to think really carefully about this one. I'll, but I'll, I'll skip ahead and I'll tell you, I've, I've wrestled with this one. What is it that's being sold? Here's my best attempt to answer. What's being sold to us is a freedom from obligation. That's what it boils down to. That's what our world views as freedom. You are not obligated to anyone. Meaning, you don't have to go to work because you owe the bank. You don't have to go to work because you need money to, to support your family. You don't have any obligations to anyone. You owe no one anything and you are completely free. And that's what we mean. No more obligation. Our world says, if you can arrive there, that's freedom. Spend your whole life, all your energy, and maybe someday you can wake up in the morning and say... I am under obligation to no one. Now, watch what Paul does with this. He says to them clearly in verse 13, you were called to freedom. That's why Jesus set you free, so that you would be liberated and free. And then he says next, only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, which I take to mean something like this, that it is possible that in your free, liberated state, you could say, well, now I am just going to serve myself. <coughs> like, if you're thinking that, Paul's just told you, yes, you're kind of on track with his argument. There is a possibility that we could look and say, well, Jesus has set me free, but now I'm just going to do my own thing. I will serve myself. But Paul says, it's the wrong place to go. In fact, look what he says next. This is the, the mind mind-boggling conclusion he's going to come to. Now he says, through love serve one another. Or, translated into way better English the way Paul intended it. Now that you're free and you have no obligation because Jesus has liberated you, choose to enslave yourself to serve others. In some ways, that seems to make no sense. You are completely free. Now, here's what you do with your freedom. You lay it down and go, I'm not going to take it. Instead, I will serve others in the cause of Jesus Christ. Now, I guarantee you, if you spell it out that clearly, to people who aren't following Jesus, they will say, you are crazy. This is the part of the gospel that just makes no sense. This almost makes less sense than the Jesus dying for us part. The part where we say, now I'm going to live in the way that I watched Jesus live, who came and laid down his life, not only as a sacrifice, but also as an example of how we're to live as liberated people. That we would go and we would do this. So let me ask you the question. Is there any space in your life where you have set aside your own preferences, and are serving other people? Isn't that a hard question? Because for most of us, this is where the rubber meets the road. Most of us, our lives get consumed with, well, we've got a job, we've got all our obligations, we've got all the things. And that area of serving others can get squeezed almost to nothing. But Paul says that's what followers of Jesus do. That's what our lives look like. See, 
This actually is a gracious verse. Let me explain why I think that. Because most of us, apart from Jesus, will spend our whole lives living for ourselves. It's just the most intuitive sort of thing. We watched it, we hear it, we're shown it, we're told to do it. It's the goal of the world around us. So we spend our whole lives living for ourselves, and then, you know, here's what happens we get to the end. We've burned through all our years living for ourselves, and we get to the end, and then we say something like this. Now that I have lived my life, I've come to the tragic realization that that was an absolute waste. But you don't get another one. <laughs> At the end, once you've learned it, you can't go back and say, well, now, now that I've learned that, I'm going to go back to 20 and do this differently. The only way you ever come to know this is through God's Word. It's the only place that you're ever going to hear that it is better to serve than be served. That it's better to give yourself than to take. And my hope is for each one of us, regardless of the age, whether you're 16 or 76, whatever stage and whatever day you're on, that you would say, from this day on, I'm going to pay attention to Scripture that tells me that this, this is the goal. It's to serve other people, not myself. It will revolutionize your life because it is more joyful to give. That's the strange irony of it. It's true when we actually do it. Paul goes on and says in verse 14, the whole law is actually fulfilled in one word. You will love your neighbor as yourself. It's what it all boiled down to. <coughs> Serving one another. Loving one another. Now here's the sad ending of this section. We'll pick up next week in verse 16. But I want you to see the sad ending because I think this is, this is an important verse. This is not one of those feel good and now we're going to go home all encouraged verses. Here's what Paul says next. But if you bite and devour one another, watch out that you are not consumed by one another. Now the way mine puts that in English makes it sound like it's a hypothetical. Like if you do this, this will be bad. That's not how it's written. It's actually in Greek called a suppositional statement, meaning Paul supposes that that is what's happening. He writes to this church and says, I know what's going on. You're not loving one another. There's no service of one another. You each are taking your camps, your views, your ideas, and you are destroying one another. He says it's like dogs consuming and eating one another. I wonder what it felt like to, <laughs> to listen to that letter the first day. I, I bet you inside my heart I would be going, no, Paul, you're wrong. You've got it wrong. There's no way that describes me. But here's what I think Paul hoped. I think Paul hoped that at the end of the day, after, after church was over, after we heard that, and when we got home, and in the quiet of the night, when you put your head on your pillow, there'd be a thought that would go through your mind. I thought something like this. Is that possibly what's actually going on? Did Paul get it right? Is he describing what's happening to our church in Galatia? Because if it is possible that that's a right description, then Paul has diagnosed the problem. You see, that if you go back and work through it, he's, died, he's told us how to fix this, and the fix is Jesus. The fix is set your eyes on Him and trust in Him and believe in Him. And it's an incredible, liberating thing. There is hope for even those moments when we look and we say, the church is not acting like the church ought to be acting. That happens. We're people. We get there. And here's the solution. The solution is fix your eyes on Jesus. And with a little story. Greek mythology analogy for a moment. If you're familiar with the story of Ulysses, he was a fictional character in Greek mythology who wanted to hear the song of the sirens. If you remember back to high school mythology, maybe this will ring some bells. But the problem was is the sirens were on an island, it was a rocky island, and anytime anyone tried to get close, the song was so beautiful that they would just drive their ship right into the rocks and everyone would die. So to hear the song meant certain death. But Ulysses decided, I want to hear it and I want to live to come out the other side. So he comes up with a plan. The plan is all the sailors on his ships will put wax in their ears and they will tie him to the mast and they will bind him there and then they will sail by. He will get to hear. They won't hear it so they won't steer into the rocks and he will live to tell the tale. And so they 
launch their crazy plan. They sail by. In his desperation to get to the island, he almost destroys himself trying to get out of the ropes. But he survives. He lives to tell the tale. And the story ends. But there's a second story in Greek mythology. The story of a man named Odeus who also wants to hear the song of the sirens. So he loads up his ship. But there's no rope. There's no wax for anyone's ears. All he takes is his lyre, this little instrument. And as they get close, he starts to play. And he is such a brilliant musician that the draw of the songs of the siren fades to nothing. And the ship sails by. End of the story. As I read through Galatians, I think there's, there are two ways to live. There's the tie yourself to the mast. Use all the rules in the arsenal. Fire every bullet we've got of legalism and law to try to somehow restrain sin. But probably in the end destroy ourselves trying to rip them off. Or there's trusting in Jesus. Fixing our eyes on Him. Listening to Him. Reading of Him. Knowing Him and loving Him. Which is like that beautiful song. That allows us to sail through life to the next with our eyes fixed on him and a hope of righteousness. Let's pray. Father, thank you for Christ. Thank you for the good news of the gospel. Help us to be a church that lives it out, that treasures Jesus. Father, help us not just to say the words that we love you, that we know you, but that in our hearts, in our minds, we would be a people who have heard the sweet song of Jesus Christ and follow him and listen to him. Thank you for your word which fuels our faith. Help us to take full advantage of this incredible gift that you have given to us. We thank you and love you in Christ's name. Amen.